Good evening, everyone, and welcome yeah. to In the Know with Kat Bobino. And today, my extra special guest is Dr. Vernon Dunn. Welcome, welcome. He is a program officer at U.S. Science and Policy. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Okay, and so please, for the audience, let us know exactly what you do as a program officer. So at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, a lot of the work that, so there's two parts. On one, on one half is the, are the honor societies that bring in all the leading um, scientists, engineering, and medicine people from around the world. On the other half are the program divisions. So it's divided into nine divisions. And my division in policy and global policy and global affairs, um, uh, we work on a lot of different things. And I work, we, we do a lot of consensus studies, roundtables, um, workshops to um, inform policy, to inform, um, to make recommendation for, recommendations for policymakers, to inform research, to um, um, a lot of, um, a lot of, Congressional committees convene us to answer questions. A lot of universities convene us to answer questions to kind of find out what's the consensus on things. What's the um, um, what's the what what are people doing on things? Just to give you kind of an idea, today one of my consensus studies was published on um, um, neuro neural chimeras and organoids research, which is kind of like a, which was a hot button topic from um, some statements that Elon Musk had made about many brains and connecting human brains to computers and things like that. So that's just an, an example on it. Um, I had did a workshop a couple of weeks ago, hosted a workshop a couple of weeks ago. We had a, hosted a workshop on the science of implicit bias and the, the implications um, on science and law. A lot of people know about implicit bias, but a lot of people don't study it and understand its implications and study it within the realm of structural racism. So that's just an example of, you know, we convene committees to to look at the impacts of different topics on um, law and policy, basically. So I work for, I primarily do a lot of research and um, writing and different things for two committees. One is the Committee on Science, Engineering, Medicine, and Public Policy, COSIMPUP, and the other one is the Committee on Science, Technology, and Law. That's half of my job. The other half of my job is uh, um, there's this program that the, the Academy's launched a couple years ago, New Voices in Science, Engineering, and Medicine. So it's bringing in to the academies and really to the field um, Globally, there's something called the young the young academies where a lot of early and mid career science, engineering, and medicine people can like have a forum to bring their ideas and their um, and like contribute to the space and kind of um, talk about um, emerging things that they want to talk about. But the academies didn't have a space for that, so um, I'm I'm I kind of took over that platform at um, after the guy, the program officer who was doing that took a, a position in the Biden administration. So um, I kind of wow. had to run running when I, when I got here and took over that position. So um, we just closed the application cycle for that. For that, we got about 840 applications for the next cohort. And we only select about 18 or 20 application, applicants for, for the next cohort. It's a three-year three -year cohort. So I probably said a lot. I don't know if it made a lot of sense, but a little bit about what I did. You, you did say a lot. Okay. A whole <laughs> lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see. I see. <laughs> so, I mean, you got a, a lot going on, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, generally, the audience who is watching, some are in STEM, some are not. So you may mm -hmm. have to break down some of the things that you were saying about okay. the work that you're doing. Sure. So, but all in all, um, you basically work in policy <laughs> and science, uh, right? Uh, <laughs> you work uh, on mini brains, which is something Elon Musk had bought up recently. Well, no, that, um, was, one, that was one, one of the 
one of right. the things that I've that I've worked on, a study. On. One of the many things, yes, mm -hmm. one of the many things, absolutely. Um, and just to remind everyone who's watching Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, you can put something in the chat. We will see it. Uh, Ashley Taylor, she said, okay, Dr. Dunn, he published. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big, that was, that was kind of a big thing. You know, those of us who decide not to pursue the academia route and, you know, be professors or, you know, go that route for, to have something published in, you know, in this, in this realm, you know, it's kind of a moment um, for me. So I, I actually forwarded the publication to my PhD advisor today and we kind of exchanged a couple emails and she was very happy to see that. So we, we kind of think, we kind of expect to not be published, published again, because I'm not doing lab research, but I'm still doing, you know, um, work that's going to contribute to, you know, the field and to, to science. Right. So, right. So, I mean, from all the stuff that you're doing, and we're going to get into that, but all the things yeah. that you have done and how you've gotten to this point, uh, what would you say is the niche thing? Because science kind of the niche thing that you are really focused on currently. Well, um, it's interesting because I could probably talk about science all day and, and my my interest in science is so vast and I don't even work on the amount, I don't even work on topics that fully cover the things that I'm interested in. You know, I'm interested in, in, in space topics and, and astrophysics and things like that and I didn't even study that. But mm -hmm. my focus is on, as I told my boss actually during my interview, I was like, you know, listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in science policy topics. I feel like I can contribute to this. I feel like I have the capacity to do that. But also, I'm here to help black and brown people learn more about science people, science policy, to learn more about the opportunities that are available. You know, there are fellowships here at the academies that I didn't know about when I was in graduate school that um, that there are not just those policies, not just those fellowships, people know about the big fellowships, about the AAAS fellowships, the congressional fellowships, the, you know, those super competitive mm -hmm. ones. But there are so many others that, you know, can maybe get you the experience that you want. And then just and, and, and then just finding different ways to connect with people to get you interested. So I, I'm, I'm more interested in you know, put in my helping people get connected and helping uplift my community than I am in in status, you know, than I am in working on science policy topics because science is never going to stop. Research is never going to stop. I'm always going to be working on these things, but mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm more interested in being in a role and in a capacity that I can uplift, you know, people younger than me or people, you know, looking to get involved in this kind of work because I've said this since I started graduate school that there are no people in there are very few people in this space that look like me that do what I do. So as mm -hmm. much as I can um, help bring people that look like me that do what I do into this space, I will try to do that. So that's my goal. And I told that to my boss, who's a white yeah. woman. So listen, <laughs> and, and, a, and a lot of my role, just to just to kind of elaborate, a lot of my role, some of my role involves selecting members, you know, doing research on committee members, like finding people who are experts in this field. And I mm -hmm. told my boss, like straight up, you know, if you're gonna be a lot of black and brown people, folks, it's going to be women and it's going to be brown people. I'm mm -hmm. going to choose some white people. I, you know, I'm not going to it's not going to be crazy. Like I'm going to choose. It's going to be balanced, but I'm going to choose. It's going to be women and it's going to be black and brown people because it's easy for years. It's been, you know, one way, you know, it's, it's time Absolutely. to, it's time to, you know, if you ask, if, if I'm on the job, if I'm choosing experts, you know, for a committee, it's going to be different. And, and the success will show for itself that, that workshop I was talking about, about implicit bias, we had one of the biggest um, turnouts for the academies ever we had over 950 people register for that workshop so wow wow that is amazing yeah that's amazing i am um, 
I do know of one PhD, a woman that I, I used to know out here in California who purposely moved to DC to, mm -hmm. in order to start doing more work in policy in mm -hmm. science and policy. And, you know, her biggest thing was, um, there's a lot of people who are making choices about the science realm that's not in the science realm. Mm -hmm. And to your point, who don't look like us, not women, mm -hmm. not people of color. So I think it's I think it's very important work that you're doing to make sure that representation is there. Mm -hmm. So thank you for mm -hmm. that. You have to. <laughs> There's no not many people, you know. We have to wake up thinking about that every day because you can't just assume that other people are waking up thinking about inclusivity, about equity, about you know making sure that we have this kind of access. So we have to do the work. Right. So. This type of work, uh, I know you have a lot of interest, but this type of work, was that what you grew up wanting to do? Was that what little Vernon thought he would be doing? <laughs> so it's funny because, you know, I can never tell my story without without saying how, you know, boys take a long time to figure out what they want to do. And, you know, <laughs> and and I, and it's it's funny to say that and then to be on this side of things and where a lot of you know, my work is looking at data and like putting data into reports and papers and seeing that, you know, for for the large part, a lot more women, you know, graduate, a lot more black women, you know, get degrees and graduate faster than boys do because they take a long time. Like we we're slower. It's just a it's just facts. So, you know, I went to uh, I started, you know, first of all, I was, I was put in a different, I was put in a unique situation. So I'll, I have to acknowledge that. Like I went to a, a white private high school, you know, so mm -hmm. that's, that put me on a different kind of path, you know, initially I was, I was, it was, it was college preparatory. It was like from day one, you know, you kind of think about where you're going to go to college. You're right. in this environment where everybody's going to college not a lot of them finished college but we'll talk about that later <laughs> but you're, you're in this different environment where you know from day one this is what you're going to do mm -hmm. um but i made the decision you know when i graduated that i wanted to go to you know a black school i was around all these people i wanted to go to a black school so i went to um i went to xavier university in new orleans which you know everybody wants to talk about morehouse and howard and stuff like that but xavier puts black people in med school yeah. consistently for like yeah. 50 years you know yeah it's just and and and, and i'm just I'm, I'm not here to yeah you know that's a different topic we can talk about forever <laughs> but i went to xavier thinking i wanted to be a pharmacist mm. and thinking that's the funniest thing about my story is that i went there thinking i wanted to be a pharmacist and i hated science my freshman year i didn't like science okay. i wasn't doing well in the courses I didn't like science. I changed my major to a math major. I wasn't even good at math. I didn't even <laughs> like math. It was, didn't even make sense. So it wasn't until um, it wasn't until I'm gonna show my age a little bit. It wasn't until after Katrina, I went back to school as a psychology major, and you know really started understanding you know finding my space and seeing that I liked you know psychology and neuro and you know mm -hmm. that kind of space and really finding what I wanted to do that I liked the neuro space um and and really it wasn't until graduate school that I figured out that I liked neurobiology because it just took that long like for the six years that it took me to graduate from Undergrad. college and yeah. then you know, two years into graduate school to understand that you have to find like any, anytime I give like talks at, you know, in seminars at undergraduate schools or high schools or like, you know, any kind of talks, I say, you have to like, like don't waste time at undergraduate in undergraduate taking a major that you think sounds good or that you think you need to do mm -hmm. focus on something that you're passionate at, that you're good at, because what matters most is that you, excelled and that you did well and that you enjoyed it because right i didn't get that until my last like year and a half and i didn't know that i didn't my problem was i didn't enjoy i wasn't i didn't excel in like the classroom setting 
that was my problem. Gotcha. I'm I'm better at hands-on learning. I'm better at teaching myself. Um, I'm better at you know I've al I've always been you know my my family can my family reminded me of this. I you know I've always loved to read. I've always loved to like do things on my own all my life. So that's the perfect kind of setting for graduate school because you're by yourself. You're right. teaching yourself. You're doing things in a lab. That's not a classroom. So there, there are different kind of ways that people learn. Some people can be in the classroom and have information told to them and then go home and try to like pick it up. That's just not the way I learned. That's just not, that's not how I was successful. It took me two years or a year and a half into graduate school to be like, this works for me. Like this is, this is what I like. This is now I like science. Now I love science. Why did I figure this out a long time ago? I could have <laughs> saved a lot of money and a lot of time. So I always tell, you know, the story about my zigzagging journey through undergrad and then getting to grad school and finding out like I I learned better this way. You know, I found out that I liked this field at this point in my life, like way later in life, because, you know, I waste, you know, I spent a lot of time figuring it out. You know, I have to give college credit where it needs to be credit, where it needs, where it needs credit. College is about figuring out what you want to do in life, but you can, you can, shorten that time by just you know doing what you want to do like doing what you enjoy like doing what you love right absolutely um the thing about it is everyone that i've been on that i've done this podcast with and i'm pretty sure i'm i've hit the 50 mark by now i'm not yeah. i don't even know but um no one for the most part i don't think anyone has a straight line when it yeah. comes to their career or when it comes to being in stem everyone has that pitfall their epiphany that moment where they're like, oh, okay, I like this mm -hmm. and I don't like this. And it's it's one of those things where it's like, it's okay to try new things, to figure out who you are, figure out what you like, the way you study. You know, mm -hmm. for me, I came from Oakland, California, which I will say is not always known for academics, um, but you know, um, and I went to I went to school and everything like that and just graduated top of the class, all that stuff. And then when I went to college, I realized I didn't even know how to study because the way that I learned in high school was get the material, regurgitate the material, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which helps me with being a biologist because that's kind of what biology is. But, you know, when it comes to everything else and trying to study and trying to actually learn and comprehend, you know, I got to like chemistry and physics and I was like, what are these numbers? What is this? I don't <laughs> I don't understand, mm -hmm. but it, it's just that way, you know, and you take a class or you take a moment and you are like, okay, this makes sense to me. I like this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go this direction. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, it's, I think that's a normal progression for most people, even in and out of STEM. You just, mm -hmm. you got to take that moment to try something new and you never, you never know, you might like it or you might learn differently once you try something different. Mm hmm so it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Um, so what did you end up getting your degree in undergrad? So my degree in undergrad is in um, psychology with a minor in chemistry. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's just a minor difference from like pre-med. It didn't set me up for... It's funny because I left... It, it's the same, it's, it's the same credentials, credentials. It set me up thinking I left grad, uh, undergrad thinking I wanted to be a doctor. I was mm -hmm. working at this inpatient psychiatric <clears throat> unit. You know, I was one of those people that had to work full time while going to school. Mm -hmm. And um, so I finished school and I was working at this psych unit and I was like, I want to be like a psychiatrist. But really, psychiatry turned me on to neurobiology because, you know, it, it was for me, it was seeing psych patient like really really sick psych patients like do a 180 after being consistent with their medication like being like they have to be on the unit and like getting their make medication two or three times a day and like seeing their behavior change like from like these you know you, i mean it's gender related like seeing these men come here like destroying rooms like off their medications and then like seven days later, they're just so nice and so compliant <laughs> and just mm -hmm. so like, you know, it's just a switch. And then, you know, seeing these, you know, 
there's just some patients I will just never forget. You know, they'll always be imprinted. I'll never be in that space again, probably because of the path I chose, but I'll just never forget what really turned me to wanting to understand like how that works, like how, you know, the brain, how, the brain. how medication can change, you know, um, brain function and brain behavior. And that's what really, you know, led me to, you know, to LSU and to my path uh, of, of getting my PhD. It's, that's a whole nother story, but so ultimately <laughs> I finished uh, with, with, psycholo with a psychology degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, what we were talking about, uh, pathways and things like that, we did get that comment that somebody said, amen. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Key, for being a part of the show and commenting. And again, everyone, we are live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Make sure you put your comments or questions into the chat and they will be on the show. So we're talking with Dr. Vernon here and we were just talking about his undergrad and we're going to switch to grad school now. So where did you end up going to grad school and what did you study? LSU uh -huh. um, in Baton Rouge. So my doctorate is in neurobiology and um, the you know there are a lot of things but one of the things i i tell you know people about my grad school experience is it's so important for people who are thinking about getting um a, a phd or even you know have heard about it or maybe even consider or maybe don't even know that that's what they should do but the phd and a, the the student and advisor relationship is so important right like mm -hmm. Um, there was a comment early for, earlier from Ashley Taylor, and you know Ashley's my friend, but you know she knows that we we know some people that have had some tumultuous relationships with their advisors that have just thrown that thrown that threw them off their path from graduating, from publishing, from just a lot of things. So I I actually went to LSU. Um, I was working at on a psych unit at at a hospital in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Full time, and I was working part time at L at Xavier at um, a graduate placement <laughs> office. I'm sorry, so she said you um, always carried eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, <laughs> my research involved uh, chicken uh, embryos, so I had to pick up the eggs from the farm to bring them to the <laughs> to the lab. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> um. um so, so yeah, so I had to, on one trip to take students to visit LSU for them to think about grad school. Um, one of my mentors who worked at Xavier told me, oh, you should go talk to the chair of the department. So I went to talk to him and I was like, oh, you know, I'm interested in neuro. I think I want to go to med school, um, but I probably need to like get a master's first or blah, blah, blah. So he was like, oh, you should talk to my wife who's in the neuro department. So I went to talk to his, uh, so, but she, he was like, oh, she's in Germany right now. So just email her. So yeah. I emailed her and that just led to like us having a back and forth exchange. We just headed off. We had great chemistry. Um, I, uh, she invited me to do an interview. Like I emailed, I, she was like, send me your, your, like, um, your transcript and your CV, like not the LSU process, like send it to mm -hmm. me. I sent it to her. We had, um, LSU does a round of interviews for their grad school um, process where you like meet with everybody in, in the department for 15 minutes. Yeah. We talked for two hours Ooh. about everything but science. So it, it's, <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just important. It, I just like to tell that story because that was just the groundwork for what turned out to be six years, six more years of, <laughs> uh, of a great relationship. And that wasn't six years because it's just six years because it's, you know, it's science. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to forget that science takes a long time because we're in a pandemic and it took a short time to find a vaccine, but science takes a long time to get answers and to when you're trying to publish a paper that has a story, it just takes a long time to get answers. So, um, um, so yeah, so I finished in, in neurobiology and I ended up doing a lot of other things while I was there. Thank, thankfully um, to her, thankful to our, our good relationship because I was involved in a lot of things on campus. 
Mm -hmm. I won some awards for my involvement on campus. Those things led to my interest in science policy. So it was, it was, it was a good time. Awesome. So uh, she goes by, hey, Dr. Tay. She said, mm -hmm. uh, good show. She's a neuroscientist as well. So she's like, okay, neuro. But the main thing, or not the main thing, but what she also said is people don't understand how important mentorship is when trying to retain students from underrepresented groups. And that is so, so very true. What would you have to say to Absolutely. that? It really is. And and mm -hmm. not even, it wasn't even, you know, the village and, and you know, you know, black and brown people understand the village and, and that it takes for us to finish and, and complete. It wasn't even just my mentor. It was the the fellowships office that that, you know, Dr. Taylor and Ashley Taylor and I know about. It was mm -hmm. the the different um, administration officials I worked with through my student involvement um, on campus. It was the diversity office. Um, the provost who actually the guy that ended up being named the chief diversity officer at LSU actually came from Xavier. So I already knew him, but oh, wow. like all these people, you know, that were instrumental in like just meeting with me one-on-one -on -one and giving me like advice on how to, there were a lot of issues that I had to deal with as one of my roles when I was, when I was, um, graduate student body president, which you're not even supposed to be involved in these things as a graduate student. Like, I would say, be, that doesn't sound, I thought you wasn't supposed to do that. You're supposed but, to be doing research and that's it. But my, okay. <laughs> she was not happy about it, but she, you know, <laughs> she knew we had a, we had a, we had a good conversation in my second year when I was like, look, I'm not going to be a professor. I don't have a passion really to teach, but I I have a passion to like do policy and you know to go that route. So this is going to give me my professional development. So you know let me let me do this. I hate her. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm speaking to a real celeb is yeah. what I'm what I'm hearing about. So you was a celeb on campus and off campus. I don't know. I don't think. <laughs> I, don't think, I so. think so. I've heard your name before. I, I sent you a message to be on the show. I've heard your name before. I heard you out there, out and about. So you know, you you do a lot of good things, and you know, people know who you are. And that's Not a good yet. Thing. I haven't. I haven't uplifted uplifted enough of my my people yet. So I'm just getting started. <sighs> I mean, that that's a whole other <laughs> discussion. But you know. What I will say is that is sometimes an uphill battle yeah. Uh, because you really want to bring in as many people as you can to take mm -hmm. them to the next level. Like even the reason I do this podcast is so pe our youth can see people who look like them or come from their background or something like that and open their mind to different opportunities, different jobs that are out there, especially in STEM. Mm -hmm. And, you know... For the 15, 20 people you talk to, hopefully you get two mm -hmm. who actually are interested and really want to follow in that footstep. So I know your I know your struggle. It's a, it is mm -hmm. definitely a struggle. Uh, but don't don't sell yourself short. You are doing great things and you are uplifting people. And you're Thank you. you know what I'm saying? Like I know we can beat up ourselves for not the numbers we may not want to have, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, you're doing wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that's the speech I tell myself. So it's not just you. <laughs> Come on, keep going, keep going. Keep going. You can do this. What people are going to love it. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to uplift the next generation. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm talking to the mirror as well as talking to you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's all good. So you decided to go into neuro. You got your PhD in that. What was right after that? Did you get a postdoc, or what did you? Yeah. Do? So that was, um, I did not, and I wasn't even interested because, you know, and Ashley and I, Ashley Taylor, who's blowing up the comments, we had, we had this conversation because, you know, there are a lot of reasons. It's funny because, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, a proposal right now for some more, um, some more upcoming workshops that I want to do at the academies. And there, there aren't really a lot of 
incentives for people like us to go into academia, really, mm -hmm. you know, the postdocs, you know, the money isn't there. Let's just call it what it is. And um, the yeah. job opportunities after are, are slim and few. So and even though, you know, people talk about investing into these programs, it's just, it's just such a slow uphill battle. So mm -hmm. I, like I said, I was involved in a lot on campus. I had done a lot of, as, as, as president um, and working with the state capital and working with the, the higher education agency in Louisiana, the board of regents. So I developed a lot of relationships there. So they had launched conveniently um, in 2017, which was a year before I finished this um, STEM advisory council. Um, they had created it by um, by law, and the commissioner of higher education was like, you know, you should run it. You're only, I was interning there, and he was like, you're the only person here with a science background. You should you should run it. I was like, okay. So um, I started doing that um, a year before I graduated. Not let's let's just say what that is. I started working full time <laughs> as a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you how tense that conversation was with my PhD advisor. I bet it was. You know, you know, you was breaking all the rules as a PhD. <laughs> but it, you know, it's it, it it was a juggling act of work that needed to be done, and it was like you know I know that because at that point I wasn't really doing I was doing experiments, but really just experiments that needed to like finish my paper uh, that reviewers, you know, had responded mm -hmm. to me. So it wasn't like everyday stuff. So yeah, it was working, <laughs> you know, eight to five and then in a lab from five to whenever. But, you know, I knew that it had to be done. But uh, it, luckily, it was only for, um, you know, from the su summer of 2017 to the summer of 20 to August of 2018. So it wasn't that long. So I did, I did the STEM council. We got a lot done. We got a lot of initiatives off the ground. You know, that's a whole nother conversation about the STEM council. It was, it was, there are a lot of STEM councils in the, in the country that are doing mm -hmm. great work that are funded by their state legislatures that they, they come with like operating budgets, like five, $10 million operating budgets. This council was created with a zero operating budget. Okay. Um, so a lot of the work that we got done, like creating a STEM high school diploma, like creating a, a program where teachers that teach in science and um, teachers that high school teachers that teach STEM courses can like go to grad school for free. Like we did that, um, we wow. got that back up and running, like those kind of different things. I put on a STEM summit and brought in over 500 people, brought in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, like um, brought in all these people. We did all that like with no operating budget. So I need you to come to California but <laughs> <laughs> or, or like teach me how to do that for California because I could be wrong and anybody could correct me. I don't see that happening out here at all. So it's funny. I, it's funny though, but there was a guy who was around during that time, and of course, right now I can't think of his name, but he was around during that time, and he had he had like earned his stripes by making like a California STEM alliance type thing, but then he like sold it to somebody, so he was out of the game. Um, but you know, California is a unique a unique case. It's the biggest. It's the biggest education um, system in the country. Like it's the highest number of students, and so it's a lot to wrangle. You know, yeah. whereas, whereas, and then it's a lot of factors. It's very diverse. It's a lot of factors. Louisiana is very poor state. It's a very, you know, it's you know, it's more oil and gas focused. It's more Republican. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of things. You know, right. But anyway. In 2018, when I graduated, you know, I was like, I have my PhD. The senator who's like running the show on the, she's not my boss. The commissioner is my boss. You know, the commissioner, like, <laughs> she's amazing. Like, she's like, she walked in the room and like people stood up, like, mm. sat up straight. Like, she worked for Obama. Like, she, like, she was amazing. 
but you know the the senator who's really like who created the council who's running the show she was like um trying to thinking about running for governor and not not really trying to like write bills to fund the council so i was thinking it was time for me to roll out you know i got this up right. and, and a lot of people you know a lot of people do that a lot of people are there to get it up and running and then hand it off right so I had to take that leap of faith and uh, <laughs> roll out in 2019, in early 2019, and come here because everybody that knows, as you as you said earlier about science policy, know that she, knows that you have to come here, come to DC, mm -hmm. the DMV area, to do it mm -hmm. because unfortunately, in in America, there's not many opportunities to do science policy work. Um, outside of DC. I mean, in, in the world, globally, there's other places, but outside of, in, in this country, there's not many places you can Not find, many at all. Um, besides yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, the, the lady I was speaking about, I think she tried to do stuff in Sacramento, which is our, our uh, capital. And, mm -hmm. you know, she ended up going to DC because that's where you needed mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa, she's my sister from another mister. She's out there in Australia. She says, I showcase the best role models. See? A role model, Melissa. Yeah, you a role model, Dr. Dr. Vernon Dunn. You a role model. Take the take the title. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, Ashley said, uh, there's money bags ain't there when you were talking about that money. It's not. I mean, it's, it's I mean, not. it's it's a it's a complicated, you know, it's a complicated issue. I mean, honestly, I think there are good intentions people all around and people want to invest in it um there that's that's a whole nother podcast cat <laughs> honestly it really you is you're welcome to come uh, back and you know say what you gotta say uh bring it on oh, uh -oh. somebody <laughs> asking for that autograph you know y'all friends y'all y'all work that out no ashley's um, never getting my autograph oh cold that's cold um, I, I'm I'm not even gonna get into that. That's between the two of you. You know, not my monkey, not my zoo. Anywho, um, but it's really good. It's really cool. Like, I don't know if you ever saw the movie slash documentary about the kids who are in high school and they go to LA for this big engineering and science program and the winner and it's kids from all over the world and the winner gets this um fully funded to go to college i think the winner mm. was a guy from like germany or something like that and so the interesting thing about it to me is this is something that's been going on for like 20 years in la where they have to see students around the world come to this huge to intel to show their science projects it's mm. like it's science fair. That's what it's called. And it's like you, you once you do a good science project and you go and you win your school, you win your county, you win your state, blah, 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 blah. You get to go there. And what boggled my mind is it's been around forever. It's been around since probably I was in high school, but I didn't hear about it. And I'm in California. I'm just in the wow. northern part. Yeah. And I have never heard of it. Never knew it existed. And um, and I've been but in somebody science. From Germany did. But somebody from Germany knew all about it. I mean, yeah. these kids came from Mexico, Africa, hmm. all through Europe, everywhere. But a student, a high school student from Oakland, California, who's eight hour drive away, one hour flight, never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, apparently they, they look for mentors throughout the state. Like you need to have someone either from your school or, or an organization who helps mentor these kids to do the science project. So I looked for it. And where I live, which is Alameda County, there was no, they had no program for it. No mentors. They, they used to have a website and it was just like, well, we closed it because nobody would volunteer. But, you mm -hmm. know, if you want to go all the way to San Francisco, you can find a mentor there. But where I live, where I grew up, nothing. And it's mm -hmm. just, I say that to say, you know, all these programs and all these opportunities that are available and what you're doing is really good because unfortunately, a lot of kids, especially in the more poor areas, don't hear about it. Yeah. They don't know. You know, they miss out on these great opportunities because no one gave them the chance. No one 
spoke about it. They didn't even bring it to the table. Yeah. And they say they want to. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I read the I read the reports. I was just reading stuff today from this big association. We need to outreach more. Mm -hmm. We need to talk to more black people. We need to like, you know, tell them more about the opportunities. They say they want to, you know. Yeah, and, and I'm not and I, I don't I'm not saying this in a negative fashion because I really like the guy. But mm -hmm. I used to know the CEO of Cal Academy of Science in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And he was a really great guy. And we, we sat down and he was like, we get a lot of white and Asian from San Francisco who bring their kids here. But how do we get Oakland? How do we get the kids from Oakland here? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I was like, easy but not easy, charter a bus. Just charter the Literally. bus, send it to yeah. the school. You, They leave early in the morning, like first period or whatever, go there do the Science Cal Academy, and come on, charter mm -hmm. a bus. Mm -hmm. Never did, and he's not the CEO anymore. And I was just <laughs> like, you asked, you know, I mean, like, like I said, overall, he's a really great guy. That's something guy. they can do. But, That's something they can do. You know, Yeah, they have the money. They have the money, but it was getting the bus there, and then, um, I don't know, trying to figure out how to get the kids there and talk to the teachers. And I was like, if you... Say y'all can come for free and here's the bus. Guess uh -huh. who's gonna be there? So I had a I had a conversation with, you know, this is a small thing, but kind of a big I don't know. It's a I don't know. It's a whatever thing you think it is. So one of my meetings at in in at the STEM Council was with a guy named Vint Cerf. So Vint Cerf is the VP at Google. Mm -hmm. He is also the co founder of the internet. Like he co founded the internet. Well, dang. Okay. Now, uh, yeah. Yeah. I had to Google. I had to Google him. <laughs> I was talking to him about like the things that they're working on. And they're like, they have, you know, I think a lot of people know about these balloons that they have in, you know, in Africa and in India and in these countries without internet access to like provide them Wi Fi. And he was talking about these wi fi enabled buses that they want to bring to like louisiana and different rural areas to give them wi-fi i'm like these are like easy doable things like to have wi-fi on a bus so like mm -hmm. you know to give access to rural areas to people that don't have you know to students and families that don't have computers and tablets and, and internet and, and all that at home so it's not that hard to think of you know just bus these people to your thing and then on the bus provide them internet access you know provide them access to whatever services they need because people have these ideas people know what they need to do it's just will they do it right and that's the, the thing is like if nobody stays on their tail you know it sounds good but i mean it sound good mm -hmm. man you know you saying you asked me i gave you a solution <laughs> I didn't see if they put in progress. And I was like, I'll help you. I will find a teacher and the students that mm. bring. We, you can start with one school and go mm. from there. Mm. And he was like, oh, that's a wonderful thought process that never came up. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get back to you. I'm going to get back to you. Mm -hmm. OK, so we, um, the, the hey, Dr. Tay, I, I know I don't. I can't say your name correctly, and I'm not even gonna try because it's rude, and I hate when people don't say my name. That's why I call you, hey, Dr. Tay, or Dr. Jones. But she said, and that's how we lose people who will discover the cures, which is yeah. true. Mm -hmm. And Ashley said, exactly, all of this talent unseen. Mm -hmm. All of that is very true, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's really ridiculous, and it's. Uh, she said, correct, we don't lack resources anymore. We lack the proper attention and concern. The concern mm -hmm. for equity is not a priority. Ooh. If you ain't said nothing but a word. <laughs> if you ain't said nothing but a word. It's so true. It's so true. And these students, um, these students are doing so a exceptional mm -hmm. and that we just don't see it because they come from areas that, you know, unfortunately are not seen like not seen or you know, and it, 
you know, are worried about. And, you know, and unfortunately, teachers are not given the opportunity. Like, I was able to study science and go to other countries because of a high school teacher who saw my my worth, as, mm-hmm. you, should, as you can say. But uh, there's so many students who may not find their desire until college or even grad school, who may not find their niche. But it just takes, you know, somebody willing to be like, here's a here's a program, here's a stepping stone, whatever. So what I need you to do is email that dude and be like, there's a woman doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Google needs to like pay for it and do a show <laughs> where she's like highlighting all these people of color through STEM. I'm just gonna put that that seed in your brain that you should probably do that email. Because <laughs> I think Google should pay for this and then like we can blow it up you know what i mean mm-hmm. just you know i you know, i gotta plant the seed of you know, absolutely like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> mm-hmm. but that's really cool uh all the things that you have said and all all the comments we've gotten it's very true hopefully hopefully especially with this pandemic i know i know in oakland they realized how many kids didn't have access to internet when the pandemic right. happened right and um they had to go to school virtually. So now Oakland has implemented like free Wi-Fi for Oakland. I've never tried it, but apparently it works. So hopefully these are things that we can start to see more of. It's wild, capitalism. It's wild. See how easy that was? <laughs> A pandemic hit and it's like, boom. Okay, free Wi-Fi. We could have done that the whole time. Whole time. It could, it could whole have time. But no, we want y'all to pay for it. Right. Access it. We want people who can afford to pay for it to pay for access to different levels of it, capitalism. But you could have had it for free the whole time. You could have had it for free. And that's the thing. And it's like, uh, and then these kids will, will see, hopefully, we'll see all these different things. Like, you're doing policy. I've interviewed a Black woman who does shark science. I've interviewed uh, people of color who are into engineering mechanical engineering all this other stuff and these kids are on social media they can see it Mm -hmm. they now have more access to it than we ever did absolutely and you know but it's it's hopefully somebody like yourself and the people who are on here who can reach back and say this is what i did let me show you how i did it you need to be the next person doing it Mm -hmm. hopefully 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 so as we have about 10 minutes left, uh, let's switch gears. And why don't you tell me what's something that you do pre-pandemic that's not science related? Like, what is your free time? I know you don't have a lot because you, you do like 10 things, but what do you do on your free time? So actually, it's, it's not even pre-pandemic. You know, I, I, I want to say that I, I create time every day for every morning for myself and I and I have since graduate school because you know your mental health is important and the things you need to do um, to keep you happy you know to keep you sane to prepare yourself for your day are important so um, in grad school I, I started I hadn't done it my whole life but in grad school I joined the triathlon team so since then I've been Swimming, swimming, biking, and running, right? So <clears throat> that's what I do. That's like what I do in my free time. I'm running, biking, swimming. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, I was doing races, like doing events. But for now, I just, you know, the good thing is moving from Louisiana to the DMV area, there's way more trails. There's a lot more availability for me to get longer rides in because Louisiana uh, New Orleans Baton Rouge is not is a little biker friendly, but there's not like um, well, there's a levee that you can ride on, but there's not like as many bike friendly areas um, to do it in. But I just wanted to give that plug to everybody to make sure you're focusing on doing the things that keep you sane. You know, do, make sure you're taking time to, you know, it's okay to be busy, but it's also okay to find time to, you know do things every day to keep you to keep you happy before you're you know i feel like i'm in i'm in a profession that's really um or i'm like dedicating my life honestly to to 
doing things that's really in the service of my people and really in the service of other people. So those two or three hours in the morning every day is all I have to myself. So that's what I do. That's that's my free time. And then the rest of it, I try to squeeze in movies because I love movies. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, mm-hmm. rude that you are staying very active during a pandemic. You make the rest of us look bad. Ah! <laughs> like, <laughs> just rude. Um, <laughs> because unfortunately, to keep myself mentally stable, I like to bake. And I used to bake and give it away. And now I can't even give it away because it's a pandemic. And now there's like sweets all the time. So now I look bad because you're a triathlete. And I'm over here eating and sitting on the couch. Well, but it's okay. You know, everyone got their thing. And I'm not going to be mad and jealous for long. I'm just a little while. Um, but, so what's your favorite movie? Oh, that's not even a, that's not even a fair question. Because there isn't, there isn't a favorite. There's some favorites. Because I watch a lot of movies. So, you know, Top I love three, then. I love the Lord of the Rings Hobbit collection. I love um, the Matrix collection. I love the Dark Knight collection. He will always be uh, the best Batman to me. I don't know about these other fake. Who is the best Batman? Uh, I don't know. I don't even want to get into this. So wait, do you like DC more than Marvel? No. Uh, It's unfair. (laughs) That's an unfair question. That's an unfair question. Marvel was was good. It was really good. You know, mm-hmm. I like the Marvel series. DC couldn't reach its full potential. I don't know if you if everybody knows this. Did you did you did you see Snyder's cut of the? I have not seen the, Justice League the four hour version yet. I watched it three times. What? what? <laughs> so it's. It, it, I have a four month old son. He takes uh, up. Most of my time. I understand, but see, (laughs) I have to watch these things. DC couldn't reach its full potential because they had a lot of producers back out. And then Zack Snyder's like son killed himself during the production. So it was a lot of dark stuff happened. So there was a lot of reasons why. So another producer, uh, what's his name? I know his name had to like step in, like finish it. So Mm -hmm. there were reasons why DC couldn't reach it. And you know, I know these reasons. So I don't want to like pit DC and Marvel against each other because they're all, they're both potentially really good. I like people from <laughs> from both of them, but that's not even my favorites. I like I like very well written movies, very well scripted movies, like good acting. Those are good action movies. I like good scripted movies. Like what? Give me an example. Like I said, Lord of the Rings is a good scripted oh, movie. Lord of the Rings. Movies okay. based off books, so it's very ah. easy. And that's the thing. Okay. I didn't read the books, but I love the movies. Gotcha. So. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I love uh, The Last Dragon with Bruce Leroy. It's my uh, favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw it like once. <laughs> How dare you? How are you going to see all these other movies like four times and you've seen that movie once? I saw it once. Classic. Saw- mm-hmm. You know what? This this podcast is over. This is ending. <laughs> I'm done talking to you at this moment. <laughs> You've hurt my feelings. Working out during a pandemic and only seen my favorite movie one time. So I'm just giving you this last opportunity to tell people any last things you want to say or how they can get in touch with you. Oh, um, my, well, here we go. I can, um, I'll put my email address in the chat. <laughs> Nope, this is Restream. You can tell it's my first time on here. Oh, that's okay. Not everybody uses Restream. Uh, this says private chat. Oh, well. I'll put my email in the chat. Everybody except Dr. Ashley Taylor can email me. <laughs> Why you don't want to give her, you don't want to give her your autograph? Just don't know her. You know? Oh, oh, okay. Well, you know, I get she, it. The company she works for, we're kind of like, you know, I don't want to say it. Um. <laughs> 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 no, um, and I, I just want to, I like to end my chats with uh, 
a dos a dos equis quote you know find what it is in life that you don't do well and don't do that thing you know it's important it's important that you are doing something that you enjoy that you are good at you know like i said going back to grad school i mean to undergrad that you know there's so many people that were like biology pre-med majors and like law majors and they like didn't like it and they were failing like doing very like you could have just been i knew doctors that were english majors mm -hmm. in school but they took their prereqs and they made a's that's what matters like make good find something that you're in that you enjoy that you're skilled at that you can do i know that you know it took me a long time to like figure out what my skill set is and like to be able to say this but find what it is that you enjoy and do those things don't waste time like doing what you think you're supposed to do I get it. I mean, I know a lawyer who went to Harvard Law School and her undergrad major was Chinese. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do, do what you do want to do. Do, do, do what you love. love. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you've hurt my feelings enough and you are <laughs> on the East Coast. So <laughs> I'm not going to hold you. Yeah, I'm not going to hold you to, uh, any longer, but thank you so much for taking your time out to be on the show. Um, if you know anyone else who might be interested, tell their story, want to be a part of it, please send them my way. And I do hope you stay in touch mm -hmm. and go ahead and email that Google guy and then <laughs> okay. have a good evening. All righty. You too. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this show and being a part of In the Know with Cat Bobino with my extra special guest, Dr. Vernon Dunn. Uh, make sure you check us out next week on Wednesday. I don't know who my guest is yet, but I'm pretty sure I will have one. So if you or anyone else who are in science, tech, engineering, or math, or any type of job that's associated with that, please send me a message. You can feel free to email me or find me on any social media, Kat Bobino, and or you can go to my website, catbobino.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I enjoyed the comments this evening, and I hope you all are having a great Thursday. Ciao.